Most people think a muscle is just a movement apparatus, right? Moves us from place A to place B. But muscle is actually an endocrine organ as well. So if you don't know what an endocrine organ is, think about what your thyroid does, right? It releases thyroid hormone or what your adrenal glands do. It releases cortisol or what your pancreas does. It releases insulin. Well, your muscles do the same thing. They release chemicals as well, many different chemicals. Um, we now know that there's tons of these things. Mostly they're called myokines, myo just meaning muscle and kine meaning a cytokine or a signaling molecule. And so what happens is when you move, you're not just moving and burning calories, you're also sending out signals to your body that tell your body what to do. And these signals leave the muscle and go to your brain and tell your brain things like be hungry or don't be hungry. And they go to your fat cells and say, hey, burn fat or conserve energy. And they go to your liver and say, hey, you know, release some glycogen. And the final thing I'll say on muscle is this. One of the major issues with changing the body, body composition, losing fat, holding on to muscle is the fact that most people, almost everybody, 95%, when they lose weight, they will regain that weight within a period of about five years. And most of those people will regain it within one year. And one of the major things that we found that is a result of that is, it's not the only thing, but one major thing is the loss of muscle mass that comes along with dieting. You could think of muscle mass as like um, metabolic potential. When you lose it by burning up too many calories and doing too much exercise, too much cardio and cutting calories and carbs too low and you lose some muscle, it's like putting your results on a metabolic credit card. Yes, you will have short term gain, but you will suffer long-term penalties and regain that weight. Welcome back, everyone. It's Mike Malto here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're with my friend Jay Tita today. Dr. Jay Tita, I should say. He's a doctor of naturopathic medicine and founder of MetabolicEffect.com and author of the best-selling book, Metabolic Effect. And today, we're going to talk about his new book, Lose Weight Here, and Jade's going to hold it up in a minute. But <laughs> we're going to talk really about right targeted <laughs> fat. So Jade, why don't you hold it up? Right there it is. Thanks, my man. Good to see you. I love that. It's great to catch up with you. So what's developed in the past 10 years? You've been doing a lot of coaching with folks in both, you know, nutrition, functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, like what's evolved in the fitness world in your perspective? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I mean, things have, uh, things are kind of crazy in the health and fitness world, aren't they? For everyone listening, we all know that um, things come in waves and things come in trends and the trendy thing right now is a uh, primal paleo type movement along with metabolic conditioning, right? And, you know, in the past it was, you know, if you were around in the 80s, it was cardio and low fat. And then it became uh, low carb and weight training. And now it's sort of metabolic conditioning and um, very high fat, very low carb. And so these trends kind of sort of come and go. What I would like to see, and I hope that you and I are on the beginning of this trend, is a individualized approach to these issues. And that's why I started my company, Metabolic Effect. The acronym of that company is ME, which tells you almost everything you need to know about my approach and my company. And, and that's what I feel like should be the next trend. And I'm not sure if it's there yet or not, but hopefully guys like you and me are going to push sort of that trend so people start understanding that uh, one size does not fit all. And that's sort of uh, my mission um, and uh, my hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great approach. And I think it's there's a lot of validity there. Like, for example, I mean, we could just compare our spouses, right? We probably eat totally different from our spouses. You know, my wife, she can do really well on a high protein, high fat, but I, I myself need carbs. So yep. kind of for folks that are getting into this and, and they're learning about like, you know, uh, keto diets and, and paleo and so forth, like how do they figure out, in your opinion, what if we can give them some practical steps to figure out their metabolic individuality? Like, do they go high carb? one week or bounce around like how do you coach people through that yeah it's a great question right because when we have this discussion the first thing people say is we humans by the way right we are we're funny creatures we like and crave certainty above all else and so we like black and white we like people to give us a list of eat these foods but don't eat these foods these foods are always good and these foods are always bad that's what we like to have fact of the matter is that's completely false one person's food that's gonna give them health and give them optimal fitness and give them optimal energy and performance and all of that 
is going to be someone else's food that does not do those things. Now, certainly we can have some general guidelines, but the idea first to your question is how do we make this distinction? The first thing you need to do, step one is let go of your biases and let go of this idea that there's all one way and let go of this idea that there is a perfect diet out there that you need to find. In fact, there is no perfect diet that you find. The perfect diet is the diet that you create. So that's the first step. Now, once we get to that step, you start to get a little concerned if you're an average human, don't you? Because then we're in the gray zone and we don't like gray zone. Um, But the gray zone means trial and error, right? It means sleuthing. It means doing some detective work. It means trying some things on, seeing if they fit, and then basically discarding them if they don't work for you and keeping them if they do. So what would that mean in terms of um, the paleo diet or high fat or low carb? Essentially what it means is once you give up your biases, then it means really looking at three different things. How your program, diet, exercise, lifestyle makes you feel. And by feel, I mean in terms of your biofeedback signals, things like hunger, things like energy, things like cravings, things like mood, things like uh, exercise performance and recovery. The optimal program should not leave you hungry all the time. It should not have you craving things all the time and it should not leave your energy Uh, unpredictable and unstable. And I have a little acronym I like to use called HEC, which stands for hunger, energy, and cravings. And it also spells the word heck. So when your heck is in check, you know whatever you are doing is working for you. So here's here's the trick. Um, If you and I are hanging out together, Mike, and we're watching late night TV, and we're both craving Doritos and cheesecake and burgers and all those kinds of things, we need to understand that that's not just because, um, and probably not because we have weak willpower. Um, We're just lazy. We're gluttons. It probably means we are not giving ourselves the right inputs diet wise, exercise wise, and lifestyle wise to create a balanced heck. So the first thing is, I said, get rid of your biases. The second thing is make sure your heck stays in check. And if it's not in check, then you know you need to start looking around for things. So for instance, if heck isn't in check, One of the best things you can do is raise fiber, water, and protein-based foods as a first step. That will help with that. The next thing is, is looking at things like blood laboratory measurements and things like that. Are they getting healthier? When you go see your doctor, are your triglycerides coming down? Is your cholesterol being managed? Is your blood sugar in a normal range? And things that you and I love, things like hemoglobin A1C and all these other fancy things, that's another potential piece to this. And the final thing is, is it getting you your body composition results? So just to repeat so people don't get lost, I basically told you four things. One, get rid of your biases. Two, make sure you keep your heck in check. Three, your blood lab should be getting healthier depending on what you're doing. And four, your body composition should be moving in the direction that you want. If you are able to accomplish those things, then you have created the diet, the exercise, the lifestyle, that fits you. And so that's how I base that. But remember, step one is get rid of your biases. Because if you believe that you have to be doing a certain thing and that very thing is causing problems, then you are in trouble. I actually give you an example of this. I call it the banana effect. And it's something that, uh, that happens to me a lot. When I was uh, doing very low carb diets, I would say, you know what? I'm not going to have that banana that you offered me, Mike, because it has too many carbohydrates and I can't eat that many carbohydrates. But then what happens is later that day or later in that week, because I didn't have that banana, next thing I know I'm eating cheesecake and I'm (laughs) eating um, French fries and I'm eating burgers and I'm eating pizza. And so I, 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 I have a name for this now, it's called the banana effect. And so had I had the banana or let myself have a banana every single day, perhaps that would have led to me not having those binges. And so that's why I say throw your biases out, whether it be I'm a high fat, low carb person, or I'm a high carb, low fat person, or whatever it is, you need to understand that that may or may not be serving you. Oftentimes what we think is the best thing, what we read in the latest book actually is not the best thing for our body. So that's a long winded way of saying and answer your question. 
No, that's really well said. And I like how you really emphasis the biases because I think that's where a lot of people struggle because they watch a podcast or watch a video or read a book, like you said, and they think they have to eat that way because that one person who has a big following and has a lot of clout and, you know, uh, credibility said that they should do that. You know, and yeah. right now what I see is kind of a trend on the internet is this intermittent fasting and folks are skipping breakfast and, and having these, you know, smoothies with, you know, high fat and so forth with, with coffee, which is, which is all good. But, you know, I, I found that if I skip breakfast and I'm really active, then I'm just craving carbs, you know, throughout the rest of the day if I don't eat until 2 p.m. So uh, what are your thoughts on that trend, you know, specifically where this, you know, folks are fasting in the morning and then skipping lunch and then just kind of eating their calories in the afternoon? Well, you said it, right? It's all good for some people. And that is the trick. For some people, it works great. And typically, the expert who's, um, putting out the information on it tends to be something that works well for them. But that is an N of one. That's one person's experience typically. And there's some good research also on intermittent fasting, but both research and experts, they do not speak for you and your body. That's what you need to understand. Research is not built for the individual. It's built for averages. They regress everything to the mean by the very nature of research. Not only that, experts and people who are saying, hey, this works for me, oftentimes forget to say the qualifier, which is see if it works for you. And so what we're doing is we're essentially saying, hey, I read this very smart person who seems to get very good results from this. Therefore, it is now my new religion. That is wrong. What you want to do, I, actually, one of my heroes is Bruce Lee. I don't know how many people follow and know about Bruce Lee, but uh, Bruce Lee is uh, one of my heroes. And one of the things he said that I think is a really uh, important thing to understand is he said, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. And so when you're out there reading research and when you're out there picking up these books and you're out there doing these things, rather than making each new book your religion. I mean, I remember, I don't know if you were like this, Mike, but I remember I read the zone diet way back when, and I was like, okay, that's my religion. That's exactly the way it is. And then when I first read the paleo diet, I was like, that's exactly what it is. And when I, I was a militant vegetarian for a while as well. And I was like, that's what it is. And finally I realized that no, it's all of these things for all people. And I had to find my own way of doing this. And the way I did this is instead of making each new book, my religion, I absorbed what was useful for me. I discarded what did not work for me. And then I added my own unique personal preferences into the mix. And so what I like to say is you have a unique metabolic expression, the way your body functions. It's as different chemically on the inside as it is on the outside physically. You have a neat, unique psychology, right? Um, psychological sensitivities, and you have unique personal preferences. All of those need to be honored in your journey to finding what works for you. And what I should say is creating what works for you because you're not going to find it. It's not going to show up in a book. It's going to show up by you reading many different things, spending time with research, yes, spending time talking to guys like me and Mike, spending time reading blogs, spending time you know, cooking and fooling around and trying things until you find and create what works for you. And that is how it's done. So specifically on intermittent fasting and specifically on putting fat in your coffee. Sure. Here's how, you know, let's go back to what we talked about before. It should keep your heck in check, right? It should move you in the right direction in terms of your body composition and it should improve your blood labs. So the way I would do it is you add in, right? These things, you start putting fat in your coffee. And if you have that coffee, and you put some fat in it and it allows your hunger, energy and cravings to not make you suffer from the banana effect. In other words, as a result, you're not eating burgers later on in the day and your energy stays nice and stable and you don't have cravings and your hunger is stable. And after a week of doing that, you're feeling like you're losing weight effortlessly. And after a few months, when you go back to the blood um, to get your blood drawn by your doctor and he's, he or she says, hey, wow, Mike, Jade, you look like your blood sugar is better. You look like your hemoglobin A1C went down. Your lipids have normalized. Your kidney function markers and liver uh, function markers are better. Then you know, hey, this intermittent fasting works. Or for me, this, uh, or this uh, you know, coffee with fat in it works for me. I would say, though, that just like anything, it's going to be one person's uh, solution and it's gonna make another person worse off. 
And you need to be able to distinguish that for yourself instead of getting stuck and frustrated when you try it and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Gosh, beautifully said there, Jade. That's awesome. So get back to the uh, metabolic individuality and so forth and and really try these different things in yourself and see what works. And I first learned about this HEC model uh, from a mutual friend of ours, Esther Bloom, and she was one of the first, I think, five guests we had on this podcast over the summer. So she was (laughs) really great at sharing that with us, which is awesome, Jade. So let's kind of talk about muscle a little bit. I remember being on the Designs for Health. I think they call them clinical rounds on Wednesday nights, like back in 2000. 2007. And yeah. you geeked out and talked about muscle. And that's what really got me kind of, uh, you know, honestly into all this sort of stuff. And so talk to us a little bit about like, what's new in terms of muscle, we know that it's anti inflammatory, it raises our resting metabolic rate, but you have a great way of talking about the different molecules that muscle secretes. And we want to make sure people are aware of that. Yeah, well, you know, most people think of muscle is just a movement apparatus, right it moves us from place A to place B. But muscle is actually an endocrine organ as well. And so if you don't know what an endocrine organ is, think about what your thyroid does, right? It releases thyroid hormone or what your adrenal glands do. It releases cortisol or what your pancreas does. It releases insulin. Well, your muscles do the same thing. They release chemicals as well, many different chemicals. Um, We now know that there's tons of these things. Mostly they're called myokines, myo just meaning muscle and kine meaning a cytokine or a signaling molecule. And so what happens is when you move, you're not just moving and burning calories. You're also sending out signals to your body that tell your body what to do. And these signals leave the muscle and go to your brain and tell your brain things like be hungry or don't be hungry. And they go to your fat cells and say, hey, burn fat or conserve energy. And they go to your liver and say, hey, you know, release some glycogen for energy. And they go all over the body and say all kinds of things. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, right? Hey, take the pain away. And so when you think about muscle, what you want to be thinking about is an endocrine organ. It is sending signals every time you move. That's the first piece to understand about muscle. The other piece to understand is the way you move, right? How intensely you move, how long you move, and how frequently you move is going to have better effects or worse effects depending on you as well. In other words, if Uh, You and I decide to go work out together, Mike, right? We're going to say, hey, we're going to get ready for a marathon running program and we're going to go run together. What may happen is I tend to do pretty well with cardio. I don't like it, but my body holds on muscle really well with cardio. I burn fat pretty good with cardio. It's pretty it's a pretty good thing for me. So I may get nice and lean off cardio. It's not my personal preference, but I might do well on that. You may find that you're getting injured right? And that you're hungry all the time and that it's increased your cravings for cheesecake and things like that. And (laughs) notice how I mentioned cheesecake a lot. That's my favorite thing. But but so here's the point, right? So that type of movement works for me, maybe not for you, right? And notice I I mentioned the fact that I'm pretty anabolic, so I hold on to my muscle well. But for many people, that type of exercise will burn fat, yes, but strip off the muscle. So maybe what I need to do is incorporate a little more cardio in my program. Maybe what you need to do is incorporate a little bit more um, resistance training in your uh, uh, regime. And the idea though is above all, no matter what you choose to do, right? So we talked about keep heck in check. Number two, get your body composition heading in the right direction, meaning burn fat, but maintain or build muscle Mm -hmm. and get your blood labs, you know, normalized in a healthy direction. So now we're in this discussion about body comp. And so for most people, what I have found is that um, the idea that we've grown up with, just like we used to say, hey, do run around jog and eat low fat, we figured out fat is not necessarily the enemy for all people. Now we also understand cardio is not the solution for all people either. And so what we want to be doing is doing things that are going to build our muscle up and help us amplify these muscle molecules, these signals that the muscle is sending and hold on to our muscle. And that means for most people that resistance training is going to have to be a more dominant part of their um, exercise regime. For some, if it's in your personal preference, like it is for me, that's all you can do, right? Like I, I love that stuff, so I do it all day, every day, and I incorporate my cardio within that. In other words, I do it faster, so I get out of breath and breathe heavily. But for other people who love cardio, right? You're not getting the results you want. Well, 
you have to look at cardio it might be fun. It might be good for your mood. It might be healthy for your heart, but it's not helping your body composition because it's not maximizing your muscle mass and these muscle molecules. And so again, one size does not fit all and you need to create a situation where you're maximizing and building muscle and burning fat, not muscle. And that means for many people, you have to balance this equation of what type of activity that I do and realize that some activity is healthy, some activity is fun, some activity maximizes muscle gain. Resistance training is going to be the thing that's going to maximize muscle gain and probably help you long term with fat loss. Cardio is great for your, your health. Research shows it's great for your mood. It's not so good for burning fat, by the way. And then there's all kinds of relaxing stuff, yoga and things like that, that are good to reduce stress hormones and things like that, but probably not so great to burn um, fat. And one thing I, I'll say here, too, is that when you think about exercise, two things. One, I think we need to make a distinction between exercise and movement, because what we've actually seen in the research is that if, uh, for instance, you, Mike, you sit at home all day, right, and sit down at your desk or in your cubicle and then go work out at 5 p.m. to 30 minutes, and I don't work out at all for the whole day, but I'm up walking and moving around all day. Guess what research shows? Who's going to be healthier and probably manage, or manage their weight better? I will. So movement is more important than exercise, meaning that just activities of daily living when it comes to body comp. And that's because if you think about the muscle, again, being this reservoir of metabolic activity, the more you move, right? the more of these chemicals you release, right? However, you can't do that intensely. If you're gonna move all day, you gotta do low intensity type stuff, low intensity walking. I'm not talking about power walking. I'm not talking about you know um, intense type stuff. I'm talking about a base of movement. And so that is really important. And the final thing I'll say on muscle is this. One of the major issues with changing the body, body composition, losing fat, holding on to muscle is the fact that most people, Almost everybody, 95%, when they lose weight, they will regain that weight within a period of about five years. And most of those people will regain it within one year. And one of the major things that we found that is a result of that is, it's not the only thing, but one major thing is the loss of muscle mass that comes along with dieting. You could think of muscle mass as like um, metabolic potential. When you lose it, by burning up too many calories and doing too much exercise, too much cardio and cutting calories and carbs too low and you lose some muscle, it's like putting your results on a metabolic credit card. Yes, you will have short-term gain, but you will suffer long-term penalties and regain that weight. And so that's the other piece here. So a big long-winded way of saying muscle is powerful. It's not just for movement, it's an endocrine organ. The other thing is we need to do everything we can to maximize the endocrine potential of muscle by moving. And then we need to do everything we can to hold on to that muscle mass or gain some by making resistance training a really central part of our exercise regime. And then the final point was just make sure that you're also individualizing that. It doesn't mean you have to jump on the cardio train right now, which is cardio will kill you is what everyone's saying. Not true. It just means that you need to find what works for you within that. Maybe instead of doing five days a week of running, you need to do three days a week of resistance training and only two days a week of running. And maybe that's what gives you the heck in check, the body composition results you want and the health you're after. And so hopefully you sort of start to understand that this is not, again, black and white. Right. Beautifully said there, Jade. But check it out. I do have my standing desk, so I'm not sitting around here, but I know you're just joking. Uh, so much to pull away there from, but I would like to kind of just highlight that, you know, this kind of reinforces what we were talking about with the diet. And we really need to get rid of our biases because I think, you know, people get stuck in this rut with diet and they, they have to eat this way because the expert and they get stuck in that same rut with exercise and they you know, I was in this rut myself. I used to live in Colorado and I did a lot of bike racing because I hurt my back in college doing deadlifts and I couldn't lift weights and I loved lower body. So I'm like, how am I going to train my legs? So I would do bike racing and it was really catabolic, you know, it drove my hormones into the gutter. Um, but I was just so stuck on it because I was like, cardio is so good for your cardiovascular system. And it, you know, I just put the endorphins and I was fixated on it. And it wasn't until I 
really looked at myself and uh, realized how my life was not where I wanted to be because I was always tired and stressed out and my hormones were off. And then so now I'm, you know, really uh, on the other side of the spectrum and just sticking to lifting weights. So yeah, it's a beautiful point because we all do this, right? I do it too. For a long time, I stayed away from any cardio at all because I just love resistance training. And I need to probably do more of that where many people need to do less of that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's kind of dive into targeted fat loss. So something when we kind of transition to muscle in that last segment, you said muscle releases myokines that affect fat cells. And yeah. in your new book, Lose Weight Here, which is a beautiful title, by the way, you yeah. talk about targeted fat loss. And I know for you know some folks in particular, guys, you know, we get a lot of you know fat around our abdomen. For ladies, it's back of the arms and glutes and so forth. So how can we really modify our workout program and maybe diet such that we're optimizing targeted fat loss? Yeah, well, the first thing is it's great marketing, right? Because everyone wants to believe that you could do sit-ups and burn abdominal fat, or you can flex your biceps and burn arm fat. And the truth is we're not talking about that um, at all. Um, we're not talking about spot reduction here. Spot reduction meaning this idea that you can exercise a body part and burn fat from that area. That's not what we're talking about. But what we are talking about is this idea of burning stubborn fat. Let's talk about what stubborn fat is first. Stubborn fat on the female physiology tends to be around the hips, butt, thighs, back of the arms, abdomen. For men, it tends to be right around the abdomen. Okay. So what is stubborn fat? Well, our fat cells have two types of receptors on them. One type of receptor is called the beta receptors. The other type of receptor is called the alpha receptor. So these are little sort of receptors that sit on the fat cell. And when our hormones bind to these receptors, they either speed fat loss or they slow fat loss. So the beta receptors, remember B for burn beta, right? Those beta receptors, when they're bound, fat loss is sped up. When the alpha receptors are bound, remember A for anti-burn, when they're bound, fat loss is slow. So stubborn fat has more anti-alpha receptors than beta receptors. And so what happens is when you start losing weight, the typical way, eating less and exercising more, and I'll get into this physiology in just a minute, but when you do that, what happens is you end up causing an effect in the body that amplifies some of the alpha receptors effects. So you might be losing weight, but you're losing weight faster from certain areas compared to others. So the example is, and everyone knows what this is like, let's say you're a pear-shaped woman or an apple-shaped man, the typical sort of distribution, and you go on the eat less, exercise more model. You start eating less and you go for, you know, on a, in one of these marathon running training programs, right? So that's what you do. What happens? Yes, you're going to lose weight in the short term. What happens to your shape? Typically what happens is you go from a bigger pear shape to a smaller pear shape and often a more mushy pear shape because you've lost some muscle along the way. Same with the apple shape. You go from sort of a bigger apple to a smaller apple. And oftentimes I've had women, I remember when this first came up, they were like, I swear my hips are growing. They're getting bigger. Now, of course, when I measured them, they weren't. They were losing just like the rest of the body. It was just that it was happening at such a slower rate that what happened was they amplified their pear shape um, because of it. And so Stubborn fat and fighting stubborn fat is really simply about speeding up fat loss from these stubborn areas so that it is more in line with the rest of the body. Now, to be clear, it will probably always be slower than the rest of the body. However, we can do a lot to speed it up. Here's the really interesting trick. Here's step one to beating stubborn fat. Stop dieting. Now, this was shocking to me when I first saw this because dieting, and let me define dieting for everybody. Dieting means eating less and exercising more. Whether you're eating less calories or eating less carbs, right? Eating less and exercising more does two things. One, well, it does several things, but two things that it does to stimulate increased alpha receptor activity is suppress thyroid function and raise cortisol levels. And actually one thing that it, we would think is beneficial on the surface, which is increased insulin sensitivity, all of these things together amplify the alpha receptor activity and make it so that that area is sl slower to burn. We all know examples of this, right? We see runners typically where they still have a little bit of a pouch around the middle. They can't get that 
middle fat or a woman who's a runner who can't lose the hips, butt and thighs. So you know what I'm talking about here. So you might say, all right, well, Jade, if I'm not going to diet, then what do I do? Remember, dieting is eating less and exercising more. Well, there's two other ways to do it, and that is to either eat less and exercise less or eat more and exercise more. Both of these ways of doing things, it's a relative term too, right? Because you can eat less and exercise less and still create calorie deficits. You can eat more and exercise more and still create a calorie deficit, but you're not doing this extreme. So it's really about finding this bell-shaped curve, how much exercise, how much carbs, how many calories to keep my system from not activating these alpha receptors. And so the first step is to break the dieting cycle. That's step one. Stop eating less and exercising more. It will work short term, but remember that metabolic credit card concept. It will actually cause you to regain the weight and it actually makes your stubborn fat more stubborn. So don't do that. Instead, begin to either eat less and exercise less or eat more and exercise more. And actually step two is alternate those two patterns. And the reason why is because our metabolism is adaptive and reactive to every single thing we do. So it adapts really quickly. So if you want to do one thing, it's going to say, oh, fine, Mike, you're doing that. Then I'm just going to slow things down a little bit. Oh, fine, Jade, you're doing that now. Now I'm going to slow things down a little bit. It reacts. How do you know when it's reacting, by the way? You know because hunger, energy, and cravings will go up, right, or get out of check, so to speak, and your fat loss results will slow down. And so what you want to be thinking about is not staying in one place for too long. In fact, the eat less, exercise more model might actually be very beneficial so long as we're not doing it for months on end, maybe four days or so, and then we need to switch things up. And so that's step two. Remember, step one was stop dieting, stop eating less and exercising more. Step two is move to either ELEL, eat less, exercise less, or EMEM, eat more, exercise more. And then stage three is then you can begin to sort of attack the stubborn fat with certain supplements and things like that. Not things that are magical, by the way, because they're not magical, but they can help a little bit. Examples would be things like green tea or coleus for scoli or things like that, which suppress to some degree the alpha receptors, but they only do so if you get the first two steps right. So again, another big long-winded answer to basically say, here's what stubborn fat is. It's because of these alpha receptors. Number two, stubborn fat stays stubborn whenever you eat less and exercise more, so don't do that. Number three, eat less, exercise less, or eat more, exercise more, and make sure that you kind of go back and forth if your body starts to compensate and adapt. And then and only then can some supplements and other tricks have a small, tiny effect. But by the way, they're not necessary. Right. Yeah, great point. We've talked a lot, Jade, on the show about the uh, the beta adrenergic receptor, but haven't heard the alpha receptor explained in yeah. that fashion. So thanks for, I love how you kind of zoom in and zoom out and then kind of refocus and let people know the take home points. That's really good. And you hit on something that just keeps coming up in my head and, and that endurance athlete, you know, that, that was a pear shape before cycling and triathlons and so forth. And they're just a smaller pear shape, but more mushy. And yeah, this is yeah. so true. We see this a lot, don't we? When, when folks are uh, trying to do the Ironman triathlon and so forth, and they don't focus on that muscle mass. You know, they're just trying to uh, burn the calories and, and uh, exercise more and eat less, which is is not what we're trying to do here. So in your book, you talk about eat less, exercise less, and then eat more, exercise more, cycling through. So if if I'm new to this program, I've, you know, I don't want to lose weight. I've never been to a, the gym. Where do you suggest people kind of start? And then where would we say, look for someone that wants to get lean for summer? Do they start with eat less, exercise less, and then move into it? Like, tell us the kind of caveats with those different groups. Yeah, the book covers this in detail. We'll actually show different levels, but let me just break it down for you like this. I suggest everybody, whether you're a couch potato and you're not exercising at all and you're eating a lot, so you would be in the eat more, right? Exercise less camp. And the people who are in the eat less, exercise more camp, both of these people should probably do what I call a stress detox. So let me explain this term, stress detox. Most people think stress, they think emotional stress. They think it's a feeling. They think it's anxiety or depression or mood changes. But stress is registered in the body anytime you have an imbalance, right? The body's always seeking balance or homeostasis. Well, eating more and exercising less is a stress to the physiology. 
But when you take eating less and exercising more to the extreme, that's also a stress to the physiology. How do you know, by the way? If heck goes out of check, you know that your hormonal system is out of balance. And guess what's interesting, right? People who are sitting on the couch eating whatever they want, they tend to be hungry all the time and have cravings all the time. People who are exercising like crazy and not eating well tend to what? Tend to be hungry all the time, tend to have cravings all the time. So both of these individuals should move to what I call the ELEL model for a short period of time. Eat less, exercise less. This means move to walking mainly and a few weight training sessions a week. Now, for maybe if you're advanced in this and you're more in the eat less, exercise more camp, in other words, you're a seasoned dieter or exerciser, you won't need to stay here long, maybe two weeks or so, maybe four weeks until your heck gets in check. That's how you know when you've had enough of, of ELEL or eat less, exercise less. Things get balanced, right? Now, if you're on the other camp, you may need to stay in that a little bit longer. And the truth of the matter is for you, it's not really, it's kind of semantics, isn't it? Because for you, it's not really eat less, exercise less, is it? If you've been doing nothing, right, at all, maybe it is moving a little bit more into eat less, exercise more. But the whole idea is we don't want you jumping to the extreme from one stressful state to another stressful state. We don't want you sitting on the couch eating whatever you want and then listening to your trainer next door and then now doing this huge amount of metabolic conditioning and running around and low carbs. That's just as stressful. So what we're doing with both groups is moving them to the middle. How do you know when you've had enough? Heck, we'll be in check and then you can bump things up a little more. So the couch potato, probably four to six weeks is gonna need to stay in this ELEL state. They'll build up a degree of fitness and then they can increase if they like. How do you know you've gone too far? Heck, we'll go out of check, right? So that's an important thing for you to understand. What about the person who's been doing and exercising and eating this way? Maybe a little less time in ELEL. Maybe if you're a person like maybe you and I, we say, hey, Jade, my heck's not out of check. I'm working out. I feel pretty good. Where should I start? Then I would say move to the EM, EM model, eat more, exercise more model right away. And you'll probably see your results pick up. So hopefully that makes sense for people that we're letting hunger, energy, and cravings guide us. We're also saying that the body needs a stress detox either way, right? That too much exercise and too little food is a form of stress. Too much food and too little exercise is a form of stress. Let's get people back to the middle by doing this ELEL, -E eat less, exercise less model for a period of time that suits that individual. And then we can move on from there to other models. And by the way, there's really four different metabolic toggles, isn't there? There's the eat more, exercise less model. There's the eat less, exercise more model. And then there's these two other models I just introduced to you. Eat less, exercise less, eat more, exercise more. When you really get savvy, you will intuitively know how to move between these four toggles, which is a really nice skill to develop. And you can't develop that skill, by the way, by being a dieter. You will never develop that skill, by the way, by reading book after book and just trying to follow rules. The only way you develop that skill is through trial and error. But it is nice to understand this. And then you can move from one to the other. So, for instance, if I come visit you, Mike, and we're going to decide that we're going to you know, go hiking every day, maybe that's going to put me in and eat less, exercise more model for a little while. Then maybe I go visit my mother and father right? And it's winter time and it's snowy outside. Maybe I'm, I don't, I'm not near my gym. Maybe I'm just going to enjoy the long weekend and eat what I want and not move. So that puts me in a eat, eat more, exercise less model. And then when I get back home to where, you know, my gym is and I'm in my own routine, then I can move into the EM, EM, eat more, exercise more model, which is where I like to be, right? So that's how you sort of look at this. And this stuff is very important for us to understand. You have to understand that it's about being a detective and creating a lifestyle that works for you instead of these black and white rules. Gosh, I love that, Jade. And what's really unique is uh, folks like in bodybuilding or fitness or powerlifting have naturally been doing this for quite some time and they call it periodization, you know, where yep. you're going from like a, you know, a bulk, you know, type phase or, an, a, you know, an overreaching phase where you're really causing, you know, strain on your body and then you taper down and you have rest weeks and so forth. So I think once folks get comfortable with getting rid of their biases, like how you introduce a call and uh, just 
keeping their hunger and uh, energy and cravings in check and kind of figuring out what's going to work for them and their lifestyle and so forth. I mean, I travel a lot for work and like you, you know, um, when I'm traveling, I'm not trying to do heavy deadlifts and heavy squats because I'm sitting all day. So I'll just walk around and maybe do some yoga and some heart math and maybe not eat, eat as much. And then when, when I'm back in my routine, it's, you know, weightlifting and, and eating more and so forth. So it's, yeah. it's really awesome. But you, I want to, touch on a couple more things here. You have some products for cravings. I want to talk about those ingredients, but when it comes to cravings, you talk about in your book, the gut hormones and bariatric surgery, and that's something we really talk a lot about, but want to share with us, you know, kind of your sound bites on what we can do to optimize our gut hormones and how they affect our metabolism. Yeah. Well, the gut, and I know you talk an awful lot about this, Mike, which is, you know, I think you're one of the leaders in this. Your book talks about it. I think it's, it's really critical. We start to understand this. Um, your gut microbiome, right? We're now realizing that this is almost like another organ and perhaps the biggest organ in our body because there's more cells in uh, bacterial cells in our gut than there are cells in our body, which is a really interesting concept. And these things are sending signals all of the time, not to mention the fact that when we eat, we also not only these bacteria sending signals that can help us with heck and help us with inflammation or hurt us with inflammation and help us with efficiency of our calories. The right bugs in our gut can actually use some of our calories for us to make us less efficient, which is a good thing if you're trying to watch your weight. But not only that, you have cells lining your digestive system that sort of taste and sense the food in the lumen of your digestive tract. So if I drink you know, some fiber or something like that or eat some fiber, these cells have these little finger-like projections that are out there saying, oh, Jade had some fiber, except they don't know that it's fiber. They just say, hey, Jade ate a bunch of food, whether that food has calories or not. Hey, brain, be less hungry. And these signals are being sent all the time. And so what you want to be doing is you want to be doing two things. One, maximizing the, the um, gut microbiome in a way that helps rather than hinders hunger, energy, and cravings and helps rather than hinders inflammation and helps rather than hinders the efficiency of how we absorb our fuel. And we also want to be taking into account the fact that our GI system, just like our muscles we talked about, is an endocrine organ and sending signals all the time. And so we can get pretty savvy now about what we put into our system that sends the right signals and basically says, hey, hunger, energy, and cravings, you mean to tell me that if I eat the right types of things, I could potentially make that better for most people? And yes, you can. And why do I say for most? That's my caveat to essentially say, don't take this as a black and white rule. Um, understand that some of you may require other things, but the big ones are protein, fiber, and water. These things together, protein, fiber, and water, can have a profound effect on heck because of the signals they're sending into your body. And then there's the idea of certain phytonutrients as well. One of my favorites is cocoa, which is loaded with phytonutrients, specifically the catechins. And cocoa has many, many bioactive compounds in it that when you absorb these things, they do things like raise serotonin in the brain and raise dopamine in the brain and raise GABA in the brain and do all kinds of things like uh, give you pleasure in the brain that can shut off cravings. And so when I think about cravings, just to round this out, what I think about is the idea of lots of protein, fiber, and water first. That's a, that's, most people get that. What does that mean? That means water-based foods without a whole lot of sugar, and then that would be vegetables and fruits, many, many fruits as well. And then plenty of protein, good quality protein shakes or good quality um, you know, lean, clean uh, protein sources. I say lean and clean, by the way, rather than fatty, just because I like for people, not that there's anything wrong with fat, I just like people to know protein sources, how they affect them versus fat sources. When the two are combined together, you may not necessarily know. So there's nothing wrong with a fatty piece of meat. I just like to say lean and clean, just as an aside, because I know you have a very savvy audience. I just like to say lean proteins, because I like for people to understand protein versus fat. And then once you understand that, then you can combine the two. But basically, then what we want to do is once we get the protein, fiber, and water on hand, then we can look at fat and starch and develop our individual tolerance. How much fat do we need versus how much starch do we need to keep us satisfied, right, to, to make our palate happy, to keep our brain happy, to keep our blood sugar balanced? That's going to vary from person to person. And then can we throw in 
some of these aids like cocoa and be able to use those to our advantage as well. Now, remember, chocolate is different than cocoa. Chocolate has sugar and fat in it. I'm talking about cocoa powder, just the powdered cocoa bean, right? The roasted powdered cocoa bean, rather than throwing fat in there and sugar in there as well. And so um, one of the products that we developed at Metabolic Effect is a product called Craving Cocoa, which is mainly a good quality organic cocoa with some branch chain amino acids in there. If you don't know what those are, branch chain amino acids are a type of amino acids that help us stabilize our blood sugar, help us uh, make ketones in our body, also send signals to our brain to shut off um, hunger. By the way, that, that chemical is mTOR, the same one that these things help with muscle development as well. And then we throw in fiber as well. And these speak to our cells lining our gut, those ones with the little fingers that are sending signals, and it speaks to um, helping our good bacteria develop with the, the prebiotics and the fibers and things like that. And all this together over time can help stabilize hunger, energy, and cravings. How would you use it? Well, I like to use it like this. Let's say you're in the ELEL model. And in my model, that, that can be many different things, but I like to just say three meals per day. And let's say hunger, energy, and cravings is not in check with that. Then maybe what you do is you add in, you know, some branch chain amino acids and or cocoa and or fiber or just craving cocoa in particular between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner and after dinner as a way to manage this. Very little calories, almost you know, negligible calories in that, but also having an effect to suppress um, hunger and cravings. The other thing I'll say on this, Mike, because most people don't get this, is that cravings are both biochemical and behavioral right? So we just talked about the biochemical piece. The behavioral piece is far different. What I mean by that is that, yes, it's impacted by brain chemistry and hormones and things like that, but most people forget it's also behavioral. You see someone eating a wheel of uh, Oreos, you're much more likely to eat a wheel of Oreos as well. So you have to also work on the behavioral aspects of this as well. So both are important. We talk about that in our book too, but what I would say is that if you're one of these people who are eating out of boredom, or you're one of these people who are eating out of um, sitting down because you're watching TV and now it's time to eat. The bi- getting the biochemical piece correct is going to help with that a little bit, but you're probably also going to have to work on the behavioral component too. And there are ways mm-hmm. of doing that. Gosh, so much to pull away from there, Jade. And I wanted to talk on mindset. I don't know if we'll have enough time. Maybe we'll have you back on to dive into mindset because I think that's a huge, huge part in making sure that people hit their goals. And I would love to hear your strategies there. But I knew we had a lot in common. But now when you started, you know, geeking out on the chocolate, uh, you know, back in college, I was just fired up on the paleo diet. This is like 2004, 2005 and the research on chocolate. And I didn't know back then that chocolate affected the gut microbiome. But it's really cool. The studies now, like you highlighted about the finger like projections in the gut and how chocolate interferes and promotes the growth of healthy bacteria and so forth. So that's really awesome. So where can folks learn more about Craving Cocoa and how can they purchase it if they want to do that? Yeah, so you can go to metaboliceffect.com backslash craving dash cocoa. And so there's a whole page there that tells you about what's in it and how it works. Um, It's really funny between you and I, Mike, you know how these things work. Keone and I had been doing this in our clinic for years and years, having people mix this stuff up, put in BCAA, put in fiber, put in cocoa. Some people loved it, most people didn't. The taste, the consistency was just tough. And so what ended up happening is some people just used the cocoa or someone just used the branch chain amino acids. Other people just used the fiber. We literally spent about a year and a half trying to formulate this. And it was a big risk because we were just like, well, we'll put it out, let's see what happens. And it just has exploded. And so uh, we could not be more happy with uh, the way people love this. The taste, the whole idea of craving cocoa is for it to be something you crave as well. And so definitely try it. We think you'll like it. It's kind of blown up at Metabog Effect. It is like the latest, greatest thing that people can't get enough of. So we're having trouble uh, keeping it in stock. Actually. Yeah, that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome, Jade. So we have two final questions here, and maybe we've already kind of tackled it. But one thing we ask every guest on the show, Jade, is if there was one herb, nutrient, or botanical that you just couldn't live without and you frequently recommend, what would that be and why? Yeah, we just covered it. Um, It it would be, it really would be um, cocoa powder. And here's the reason why. Um, We didn't know this for a very long time, but the interesting thing about cocoa is, is that the number one thing, your body's gonna do this regardless, by the way. If you follow eat less, exercise more, you're gonna get way more of it. But even if you do eat less, exercise less, and eat more, exercise more, the body compensates and adapts. 
having hunger and cravings is a natural phenomenon. We need low calorie or no calorie things that can help us quench these cravings and quench this hunger. Cocoa happens to be the best that I have seen clinically anywhere. And so, and to me, the other reason I choose it is not just because it's a powerhouse biochemically, but because people like it and will use it. We are used to this and personal preferences are huge. And so this idea of using cocoa in this very medicinal way and for dieting is very, very important. And the, the reason I love it, I can certainly probably come up with other compounds that are maybe more powerful in terms of their healing effects and this and that, but I won't be able to come up with one that is as readily available and that people can use and are excited about using and will use day in and day out. That's why I choose cocoa. Mm -hmm. Well, and moreover, it has so many different beneficial effects. Not only, like you said, people love it and they crave it, but it affects endothelial function. It's anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, blah, blah, blah. So there's many like uh, additional benefits. So yeah, uh, it's, it's like a, it's a shotgun approach for health in a sense. It hits everything. That's awesome. Great, Jade. So uh, second final question here. If you were to bump shoulders with Barack Obama or a future president in an elevator <laughs> and they turned to you and said, as a naturopathic doctor and health coach and you know fitness expert, what would you like me to reverberate around America in terms of a health tip or lifestyle tip? What would you say and why? Yeah, and this, this is a very easy question for me. And that is the rule of say one thing to everybody. There is no such thing as a diet that you find you create the perfect diet. So there's only one rule in nutrition that everyone should know, and that is do what works for you. That's what I would want him to say. Do what works for you. Now, one caveat with that, right? To do what works for you, you do have to understand how to read your physiology. And so what I would say is any health coaches here, any other uh, health practitioners like you and I, personal trainers, nutritionists, or health savvy people who are listening to this, you need to help yourself and help other people understand to stop following these one size fits all protocols and understand that one person's fat loss food is another person's fat storage food. One person having a little bit of wine helps them eat a healthier diet. One person having a little bit of wine makes them drink a gallon of wine and is unhealthy for them. And so this, there's no such thing as a good food and a bad food, in my opinion. There's no such thing as good exercise and bad exercise. There simply is what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And that means becoming the metabolic detective. So if, if, our, uh, if uh, President Obama and Congress and every healthcare practitioner could get that out, I think we'd be a lot better off. Might hurt the, the, the weight loss and dieting industry a little bit, wouldn't it? But the idea is there's plenty for us to do and teach inside of helping people figure out what works for them. We don't need these one size fits all protocols. They don't work anyway. Mm -hmm. Gosh, beautifully said there, Jade. So on that note, I think I'm going to go have some cheesecake because you recommended it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, my man. Me too. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, can you hold up the book again and kind of yep. tell our listeners when that will be available? This is going to be out uh, April 14th. You know, so it's coming soon. Um, thanks for thanks for letting me share it, Mike. And you know, the truth of the matter is lose weight here. The book, it really is everything we just covered. I mean, we covered everything here. It's not a book to, to basically be followed as a one size fits all protocol. It really does teach you how to be the metabolic detective. I love that. Well, thanks so much for being here, Jade. Very informative. I'm going to be the first one to purchase your book and I'll write a review on Amazon. So uh, I appreciate that, man. And for everyone listening, we, we will do the show notes and information about uh, Jade's website and Craven Cocoa and so forth. I'll post that at highintensityhealth.com slash drtita for Jade Tita. So Jade, hope you have a great day and thanks again for tuning in. Mike, thanks so much for your work, my man. I appreciate it so much. Thank you.